ready i think uh, we'll start immediately all the presenters are present those who are present please raise your hands if everyone is there good so first presenter is dr bhagyashree pawar are you ready Hello friends This is a case of 5 year old boy with developmental cataract But there is something unusual it is partially absorbed and as i notice there is wrinkling on anterior capsule with fibrous membrane beneath it The greatest challenge in this case would be making anterior capsular excess so my stra- strategy here is to make a small initial excess then separate the fibrous membrane from anterior capsule and then make a large secondary capsular excess initially i tried to make the capsular excess with cystitome but as you can see the anterior capsule is stuck to the membrane so i switched to microcapsular forceps trying to find the plane between anterior capsule and the fibrous membrane as you can see it is so firmly stuck if you pull the anterior capsule it is causing stress on these zonules and finally i find the right plane and complete the small capsular excess I'm injecting the cohesive viscoelastics just beneath the anterior capsule to make a place for my spatula. I'm trying to make a little space between the two planes. And with the spatula here now I'm trying to perform the blunt dissection. After making the small area of dissection I inject the viscoelastics repeatedly. and continue the blunt dissection and slowly the anterior capsule is getting separated it needs a lot of patience as you can see there is enough space between the two layer and finally the membrane becomes completely separated from the anterior capsule it's free from its adhesions but still it is attached superiorly meanwhile i aspirate the remaining semi liquefied lens material with by manual irrigation and aspiration now the last task is taking out the fibrous membrane out of the eye i try to dissect the superior adhesions with injecting the cohesive viscoelastic between anterior um, anterior capsule and the membrane and the finally membrane is free and i pull it out with the microcapsular forceps in toto Now it's the time to assess my capsular excess. It's small, around 3.5 to 4 mm. And I definitely need to enlarge it. I'm giving a tangential nick with scissors and enlarging the capsular excess with my with microcapsular forceps. final rexus turns out to be a bit larger than i would like to have 
it's around 5.5 to 6 mm in size. I always do primary posterior capsular axis in all pediatric cataract. I am giving a neck with cystitome and then injecting a small amount of viscoelastics in Berger space and completing the posterior capsular axis. Grabbing and re-grabbing with the forceps is crucial to achieve a small and adequate size rexus. The anterior vitrectomy is done. And after injecting the cohesive viscoelastics between the anterior capsule and the posterior capsule, three-piece eye oil is inserted in the bag. It's a good idea to support the RL posteriorly with the spatula when your posterior capsule is not intact. Finally, the anterior chamber is checked for any vitreous with triamcinolone and anterior chamber is washed thoroughly and that's it. I achieved my goal of placing the IOL in the bag which would have been difficult had I resorted to membranectomy with anterior cutter. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next presenter is Dr. Hemlata. And after that is Dr. Mohiddin. You are Dr. Mohiddin? Hello everyone. Today I am going to discuss about diagnosis and management of cyclodialysis cleft. Cyclodialysis cleft is an uncommon entity and can be difficult to diagnose accurately and treat. This video will explain how to diagnose cyclodialysis cleft and will demonstrate technique of surgical management. Cyclodialysis cleft are usually caused by trauma, most commonly blunt trauma and post-surgical commonly following cataract surgery. Uncommonly they have been seen to occur post-trabiculotomy and intravitreal injections. Cyclodialysis cleft results when ciliary body band torn away from sclera adjacent to scleral spur. This disinserts the ciliary body from the sclera and a small fistula is created between supracoroidal space and anterior chamber. Aqueous from anterior chamber then flow preferentially into supracoroidal space as there is initial resistance to flow. This result in low intraocular pressure and shallow anterior chamber. Trauma to flow may also result in angle recession which can occur in conjunction with cyclodialysis cleft. It is therefore very important not to confuse these two entities. Angle recession occur when anterior face of ciliary body band is torn between longitudinal and radial and circumferential muscle fibers. Widening of anterior ciliary face is seen on gonioscopy. Clinical signs of cyclodialysis cleft include shallow anterior chamber, low intraocular pressure, usually less than 5 mm of mercury. Posterior segment changes occur due to hypotony and include swollen optic nerve head, tortuous retinal vessels, hypotenuse maculopathy, choroidal effusion, and retinal damage. Differential diagnoses include occult leaking from sclerostomies after vitroretinal surgery, graft hose junction after penetrating keratoplasty, old scleral wounds. Cyclitic membrane on ciliary body can create traction, which in turn results in hypotony. Success of cleft repair surgeries is primarily dependent on the right localization and accurate estimation of the extent and number of cleft. Hence, acquiring skills of pre-operative and intra-operative gonioscopy and ultrasound biomicroscopy are mandatory. Pre-operative ultrasound biomicroscopy, especially by the dynamic protocol, increases the chances of identification and objective quantification of the cleft. This is a surgical video of a patient who had hypotony for 6 months post-injury with a cricket ball. Intraoperative gonioscopy done to localize the extent and the number of clefts. Corneal traction suture applied to provide adequate exposure. 
localize conjunctival peritomy done in the area of the cleft with the help of the Westcott scissors. Hemostasis is achieved with the help of the wet field cautery. Tight port is made and viscoelastic is injected in anterior chamber with 30 gauge cannula. Initial incision in sclera is 3 mm from the limbus and a laminar scleral flap is created with the help of a crescent. Transillumination is done to identify area of disinsertion of ciliary body from the sclera. Full thickness incision is created 1.5 mm from the limbus with the help of a surgical blade and extended both sides with the help of a scissors. Note a gushing fluid sign in suspected cleft area. It is an indicator of fluid filled cavity in the supracoroidal space consistent with a cleft. Direct suturing of sclera to ciliary body to sclera was done. Care was taken during suturing to avoid neurobranches and accompanying vessels. The intraocular pressure may rise dramatically post-operatively and may cause prolapse of uveal tissue. Tensile strength of suture material is of utmost importance. We recommend 9-0 proline or 10-0 nylon for scleral flap. If cleft has been successfully closed, the intraocular pressure may rise sometimes spectacularly and often needs treatment medically and surgically. We recommend use of topical steroids sparingly after surgery to encourage tissue addition. Transillumination done to confirm reattachment. Cryotherapy done for supplementing suturing in intermediate areas between the sutures. Cryotherapy results in cleft closure through inflammation and scarring. Subsequently, scleral flap and conjunctival closure was done. Bimanual irrigation and aspiration was done to remove the viscoelastic and air is instilled in the anterior chamber. Subconjunctival gentamicin and dexamethasone is given at the end of the procedure. This is the external appearance post-operatively of the surgical cleft repair demonstrated earlier. This is gonioscopic appearance of the site pre-operatively and post-operatively. All patients after successful cleft closure require lifetime monitoring for the possible development of glaucoma. To conclude, the success of cleft repair surgeries is primarily dependent on the right localization and accurate estimation of the extent and number of clefts. Hence, acquiring skills of pre-operative and intraoperative gonioscopy and ultrasound biomicroscopy are mandatory. There is an unmet need for understanding the surgical saviors for managing the condition. Yeah, thank you. One second, one second, one second. Uh, um, this is a regular closure of a cycloidal uh, dialysis. Yes, yes. Anything different from a regular no, established sir, this procedure? Is, this is regular procedure which you used to do on a daily basis. This is how regularly we uh, deal with the cycloidalysis. <coughs> and also, uh, you <coughs> suggested 10 0 uh, nylon or 9 0 proline, proline. <coughs> for <coughs> adequate strength of the closure. 10 0 nylon or 9 0 proline. proline. Or or? Or. Okay. Ten zero nylon. Vanquish.
So vanquish the hurdles of filtering surgery with gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy. Glaucoma is the leading cause of irreversible blindness worldwide. Trabeculectomy has been the mainstay of glaucoma management for decades. Despite improvements and innovations, trabeculectomy still comes with a heavy cost of complications. Though we expect and wish every surgical outcome with low diffuse blep and smiling face of the patient, unfortunately we have to face several complications ranging from shallow anterior chamber, blep bleed, blebitis, hydrotony and choroidal detachment. Increasing patient quality of life and decreasing the rates of postoperative complications have been the driving forces behind the development of conjunctiva sparing minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries. Various MIGS techniques have been described since 2000s. Among those, the gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy was first introduced in 2014 by Grover et al. GAT attempts to disarm the resistance from the trabecular meshwork and restore a more natural outflow of aqueous fluid within the eye. Though it is technically demanding, it provides a very cost effective MIGS procedure when a polypropylene suture is used. Let's look at some complex case scenarios. So here is the case of 25 year old female who was diagnosed with juvenile open angle glaucoma in both eyes with advanced cupping and uncontrolled intraocular pressure despite maximal medical therapy. This is the fundus picture showing advanced cupping in both eyes with advanced field defect in both eyes and early field defect in left eye and OCT corroborating with the above findings. The patient underwent right eye combined trabeculotomy with trabeculectomy. After two weeks of surgery, the intraocular pressure was 6 mm mercury, but at two months postoperative period, the intraocular pressure dropped to 4 mm mercury with the patient developing hypotony maculopathy. At three months post-op, the intraocular pressure remained low at 3 mm mercury with persisting hypotony maculopathy. This is the OCT picture showing hypotony maculopathy in the patient. So what to do next in the left eye? For the left eye, the patient was planned for gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy considering the high intraocular pressure and the complication in the right eye. After putting adequate viscoelastic and docking the gonio lens, a goniotomy was made and the Schlem's canal was exposed. Then the blunted proline tip is introduced into the Schlem's canal and threaded slowly along the Schlem's canal 360 degree in small strokes. The proline suture is pushed gently and when the tip appears on the other side, it is gently grabbed using the max grip forceps and the 360 degree GAT is completed. Postoperatively, the patient's intraocular pressure was under good control and thereby avoiding complication as well. Next is a 60 year old female patient who was a known case of primary open angle glaucoma and was on maximal medical therapy. This patient had advanced glaucoma and uncontrolled intraocular pressure. The field report showing the uncontrolled nature of the glaucoma and the advanced field defect almost approaching fixation. This patient underwent gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy with phacoemulsification in the right eye and the intraocular pressure control was really good in this patient. This is a video showing the GAT procedure being performed in the right eye of the patient. The patient had good control of intraocular pressure in both the eyes. In angle closure glaucoma, phacoemulsification with gonio has failed to achieve a satisfying intraocular pressure level 
because of dysfunctional trabecular meshwork. In such cases, combined phaco emulsification along with goniocyanicolysis and GAT are found to achieve target IOPs. So this is the patient who is a 52-year-old female patient who is a known case of angle closure glaucoma and advanced cupping in both eyes with uncontrolled intraocular pressure. This patient underwent young peripheral iridotomy after controlling the intraocular pressure. The patient was started on maximal medical therapy and after adequate control of intraocular pressure, the patient was planned for goniocyanicolysis with gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy along with phaco emulsification. The goniocyanicolysis was achieved using a tenito microhook. The tenito microhook is introduced through the paracentesis and gentle goniocyanicolysis is being performed. After achieving the goniocyanicolysis, the blunted proline tip is introduced and goniotomy is done. The Schlem's canal is exposed in the nasal quadrant and the proline suture is threaded and the procedure is performed. The same patient underwent GAT with phaco emulsification within a gap of two weeks. The microscope tilt and the patient positioning is one of the key factors for a successful GAT. Postoperatively, the intraocular pressure was well controlled in both eyes without any complication in the patient. The most common complication following a GAT procedure are high femur and transient intraocular pressure spikes. The high femur occurs when Schlem's canal is filled with blood due to the reflex from the episcleral veins after the circumferential rupture of the trabecular meshwork. The transient IOP spikes are related to prolonged high femur and can be eliminated by washing out the anterior chamber. For a successful GAT, the practice of intraoperative gonioscopy with direct gonio lens in phaco procedure should be started first. The microscope rotation to 35 degree towards the surgeon and patient's head 35 degree away from the surgeon for an end fast view of the trabecular meshwork. Keep the anterior chamber formed at all the times using good viscoelastic. The proline end of the suture should be blunted with cautery and avoid any air bubble between the lens and the cornea. To conclude, GAT is a safe procedure which can be considered in varying spectrum of glaucomas due to its high safety profile and intraocular pressure lowering efficacy. So, um, you could have shown how the tip of the proline is blunted. Yeah. Just like that, just for people to know. Uh, and the second thing is, uh, um, which all cases would you say you should not be doing this? Uh, one more thing is sinuculysis. Have you tried uh, pulling on the pupillary margin to do the sinuculysis rather than directly touching on the angle and doing? We don't believe it just goes down. It just, it just? Just the, 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 the pass goes down. So huh. the sinic, huh. when you use the, your instrument, uh, I use a, a micro hook, uh, tenito micro hook, just pull that and it just goes down. I cannot believe that it so easily can come down. That's what. Mm. So it is uh, very surprising. Unless you do it, you will not know. Mm. It so easily comes down. Yeah, and how much do you blunt the tip, the tip of this uh, one? Just a little, little mushroom, not too much. Just a little mushroom. Some if the new cartridge, no need to touch. <laughs> Should not touch. Just not Should touch. not touch. Should not touch. Yeah. yeah. Which one? Which one, Which all cases do you think uh, this is uh, very useful? Because uh, it works in most of the cases. Is I what you say. For our setup, it is useful for all the cases. So if you try GAT, and it has to surprise, angles closer, 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 PSCG patients are doing very good. So we run some 70 cases. They're doing extremely good because less complication post-op, especially post-triple, a little more complicated angle of the glaucoma. And GAT is less how long? How long do you have follow-up of uh, six doing very good for? Six months. Six months? Yeah. And also we put him on a pilot car, so mm -hmm. doesn't need for glasses, the six, six, N6. <laughs> Very happy now. They are now like a you know, <coughs> uh, catered patient that come and go. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So now the next presenter is Dr. Indira.
Dr. Dr. Indira is Dr. Bharat. DIY for glaucoma procedures. Practice makes a doctor perfect. Glaucoma is the leading cause of irreversible blindness in the world. By 2040, around 112 million people in the world will be affected by glaucoma. But are we having enough glaucoma specialists to tackle this burden? The number of ophthalmologists worldwide is estimated to be 2 million, but many of them do not operate or do only a few number of surgeries. Welcome to the world of glaucoma fellows. After completing clinics, enthusiastic glaucoma fellows walk towards the wet lab, chattering away happily, discussing what to practice on the goat or human eye. To their disappointment, they find that there are no goat eyeballs to practice that day. So no wet lab practice, but tomorrow is the operating room posting. Necessity is the mother of invention, or rather innovation in our case. An idea pops up. Here begins the journey for the do-it-yourself glaucoma project. First, we had to create an alternative to goat or human eyeballs for wet lab practice. We thought of silicone eyeballs. They are a good, reusable option, but a bit costly and difficult to find and maintain. So we thought of making our own practice eyeball. We took a pair of gloves, cut out the finger, and filled one finger with water. another with leftover viscoelastic, and the third with toothpaste. We tied them up with an elastic band of used masks. Then we mounted it on a used keratome with its cover and used its handle to hang the eyeball on the slit lamp. Let's see what problems got solved. We tried measurement of IOP by eye keratinometer, tonopen, applanation tonometer, central corneal thickness by ultrasound pachymetry. One can hold it like an eyeball vertically and practice as in a human eye. All of our nurses, students, and consultants tried it and liked it, but we wanted to explore more possibilities. So we thought, can we mimic surgical procedures? Then we tried doing AC decompression using a 26 gauge needle. We tested with water, but it collapsed once it was punctured. Then, next, we filled the glove finger with viscoelastic because it was transparent and at the same time more viscous. Next was blood needling, for which we used red toothpaste to get the red glow and better visualization. We marked the limbus and scleral flap on the model eyeball and utilized a 26 gauge needle to practice blood needling. Then we thought, what about lasers? So we created two models. First, we used a suture sponge with pre-placed sutures on it in radial fashion mounted on a used keratome for practicing laser suture lysis. This served two purposes, practicing suture placement, and second, of the laser suture lysis using double frequency NBAG laser. We made another eyeball for laser peripheral iridotomy, for which we used one, old trial lenses, ones with the glass to mimic the cornea and ones without the glass to give a little bit of depth to mimic the anterior chamber. Two, a carbon paper to mimic the iris. Three, a waste bottle cap, preferably red, which acted as the posterior segment and the red contour mimicked the fundal glow. Four, micropore to tie up it all up together. Five, used keratome to mount on the laser slit lamp. We finally tried working on the plan for which all started, to learn to raise the flap. So, we took the waste sponge, marked the specifications of the flap with calipers, and raised the flap with a blade. And sutured the flap. The sponge gave the feeling of the sclera indeed. Finally, the happy moment arrived. Having practiced almost all the instruments, flap raising, suturing, and laser suture lysis, the fellows felt more confident in the OR and in the clinics. This video shows that where there is a will, there is a way, and nothing can stop if a student wants to learn and a teacher wants to teach.
थैंक यू was this video presented last year in innovations arc think under the apple tree no sir uh, no uh the suturing and uh, flapping on the sponge and all yes sir uh, been there for last 20 30 years uh, i have also done sir, <laughs> so that is fine uh, okay. uh, but otherwise uh, initial ones were good hmm. so one suggestion to you is is this your uh, voice over uh, sir my friends Uh, yeah. but whatever whenever you record voice yes, uh, be slower and clearer yes sir so when we hear for the first time no we should be able to grasp it fast yes sir it's highly accented and too uh-huh. quick as if somebody from foreign country is speaking okay sir so a bit speed, simple speed if you reduce yes, we sir. can hear words more clear yes sir i have seen similar thing in thing under the apple tree maybe 2 years ago okay sir by john davis akkara i think it was Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. thank you, sir. Spring, spring thing to hold the globe and similar also. So right? many. Many, yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Thanks. Now it's Dr. Bharat Gurna. Illuminating the shadows. A deep dive into a rare and mysterious keratitis by Bharat Gurnani. Decoding Pythium insidiosum keratitis, a rare ocular challenge. This film provides an in-depth exploration of a rare, There vision no endangering voice. type of keratitis known as Pythium insidiosum keratitis. Can you uh, can you rewind? Go please go back from the beginning. Which causes rare vision from the beginning keratitis in humans. Pythium illuminating the shadows, a deep dive into a rare and mysterious keratitis by Bharat Gurnani. Decoding Pythium insidiosum keratitis, a rare ocular challenge. This film provides an in-depth exploration of a rare, vision endangering type of keratitis known as Pythium insidiosum keratitis. Pythium insidiosum is an oomycete which causes a rare vision threatening keratitis in humans. Pythium keratitis closely resembles fungal keratitis and is also known as parafungus. This disease presents a significant clinical, morphological and microbiological diagnostic challenge. This diagnostic enigma has long puzzled medical researchers and clinicians. This disease has been predominantly reported in tropical and subtropical regions, including Thailand, the United States, China, Israel, Australia and India. The first case of systemic pythiosis in a human was reported in Thailand in 1985. However, the first case of Pythium keratitis was reported in 1988 and since then, large-scale studies from all over the globe. It affects all age groups with a higher incidence in certain professions. Studies quoting the incidence and prevalence of Pythium keratitis are scarce in literature due to the rarity of the organism. It is important to understand the hallmark clinical features of Pythium insidiosum keratitis to distinguish it from other close mimickers. The typical clinical features that distinguish it from fungal keratitis are patchy reticular dot like subepithelial and stromal infiltrate, multifocal infiltrates, cotton wool like stromal infiltrate with high faded edges, peripheral furrowing, early limbal spread, and peripheral corneal thinning with guttering and tentacular projections. In recent years, there's been a notable increase in Pythium keratitis cases thanks to heightened clinical awareness, better diagnostic tools, and more research into treating the severe condition. Its symptoms often resemble those of other types of keratitis, making diagnosis challenging. However, its resemblance to fungal, mycobacterial, acanthamoeba, and bacterial keratitis complicates diagnosis. These similarities in clinical features demand a high level of suspicion and careful differential diagnosis to identify and treat Pythium keratitis effectively. Systemic associations. This condition is associated with various systemic diseases including paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria and aplastic anemia among others, further complicating the clinical picture. Laboratory investigations play a key role in early diagnosis and targeted treatment of Pythium keratitis. Corneal scraping is done under topical anesthesia using a chemora spatula or a Bard Parker blade. 
the samples undergo gram stain and potassium hydroxide wet mouth tests, followed by culture on sheep blood agar and potato dextrose agar. The growth characteristics of Pythium species are observed under specific incubation conditions. Histopathological stains such as hematoxylin and eosin, periodic acid shift, and gomorimethanamine silver are used on formalin fixed, paraffin embedded samples to identify Pythium filaments. Various staining durations and reactions are employed to confirm the presence of Pythium. Molecular diagnostics such as polymerase chain reaction PCR, targeting specific regions in Pythium's ribosomal RNA is used for species identification. Different genes and regions are targeted for phylogenetic studies. Duplex PCR and DNA sequencing methods have also been developed for more efficient diagnosis. Serological tests include Western blot, enzyme-linked immunodiffusion assay, immunodiffusion, and hemagglutination assay. Serological tests detect antibodies against pythium in serum, with varying degrees of sensitivity and specificity. Each method plays a crucial role in identifying this elusive organism. Treatment strategies for pythiosis Antifungals, initially, drugs like natamycin, voriconazole, and itraconazole were used, but they have limited success. They are started before culture results and switched to targeted treatments once results are available. Antibacterials, for confirmed cases, a regimen of topical linezolid and azithromycin, along with oral azithromycin, is recommended. Treatment success is monitored through regular follow-ups and clinical signs of improvement. But often surgical intervention like therapeutic and tectonic keratoplasty are mandated for severe non-resolving cases. Adjunctive treatments techniques like cryotherapy with ethanol and the use of cyanoacrylate glue with bandage contact lenses are employed for better outcomes and to prevent recurrence. Post-operative management is critical for recovery and good outcomes in these cases. This includes continued use of antibiotics, adjuvant drugs to manage symptoms, and careful monitoring for complications like cataracts and glaucoma. Graft survival is a significant concern, and regrafting might be necessary for visual rehabilitation. Patients should be counseled about the disease prognosis and future follow-ups. Pythium insidiosum keratitis can be mistaken for fungal keratitis due to similar clinical, microbiological, and histopathological features, especially in cases that do not respond to typical treatments. The other close mimickers are bacterial keratitis, acanthamoeba keratitis, peripheral ulcerative keratitis and atypical mycobacterial keratitis. Differential diagnosis is key, as pythium keratitis can mimic other forms, leading to mismanagement. Early detection and correct identification are vital for effective treatment. Complications are usually vision-threatening and include secondary glaucoma, corneal perforation, corneal melt, retinal detachment, choroidal detachment, recurrence of infection and thysis bulbi. Systemic complications such as cavernous sinus thrombosis, systemic vasculitis, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria and aplastic anemia are severe and can even lead to death. Our novel diagnostic and treatment algorithm aims to improve outcomes through dynamic and targeted approaches. This is the diagnostic and management algorithm proposed by Gurnani et al. Thus to conclude, as we decode the mysteries of Pythium insidiosum keratitis, we open new pathways to preserving vision and improving lives. Understanding Pythium insidiosum keratitis is critical as a step towards better ocular health. How many cases you have studied? Uh, sir, we have published uh, earlier this data, 43 patients we published uh, retrospective analysis in 2021 in Indian Journal. And uh, later we published a few case reports, this all data is uh, like our own published data, sir. the images taken from and the protocol, we uh, the flowchart was proposed by us in clinical ophthalmology. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Next is Dr. Madhu Shekhar. When the nucleus stops rotating, the golden hour of decision making 
In cataract surgery, surgeon relies on certain indirect visual clues for identifying underlying complications. Early identification and timely management is very crucial. Such cases with obvious findings can be easily diagnosed preoperatively, but that's not the case always. Like this case where the underlying zonular dehiscence showed up only after viscodilation intraoperatively. These can be challenging and test the surgeon's agility during surgery. Anticipation is the first step. In cases of trauma, hard ground cataract, pseudoexfoliation, Marfan syndrome, homocystinuria, etc., we should be cautious about a hidden enemy. There could be certain subtle signs of a zonular compromise that can be picked up early in surgery, like dimpling of the anterior lens capsule during Rex's initiation, difficulty in raising the flap of the anterior lens capsule, and further, while proceeding with the Rex's, wrinkling of the anterior lens capsule can be noticed. At times, these signs could be too subtle to be picked up. So what if we miss them? Do we get a second chance? Yes. Our video points towards those indirect clues which could save the surgeon from having a detrimental complication. Look out for these signs. 1. A sudden fluctuation in the anterior chamber depth. 2. When the nucleus stops rotating. In this first case of a small pupil with dense pseudoexfoliation, after his first job, the surgeon notices a sudden fluctuation in the anterior chamber depth. At this critical moment of decision making, the golden hour, he promptly decides to place capsule hooks. He makes four paracentesis and places the capsule hooks to stabilize the back. He also injects a CTR for further supporting the back. He continues the surgery, does the chop and the phaco emulsification easily. Now that the capsule hooks and the CTR are holding the bag firmly, he comfortably does the cortex aspiration, carefully and gently. He implants a foldable iron into the bag. The second case of a hard brown cataract with pseudoexfoliation started off like any other normal case. Surgeon does a well-centered, continuous curvilinear capsular rexus and proceeds with the surgery. During his initial few chops, the nucleus can be seen rotating freely in the back. But later on, he notices that the nucleus stops rotating. This alerts the surgeon. Yes, yet another golden hour. He reassesses the situation and decides on placing capsule hooks. After placing the capsule hooks, the nucleus rotates freely and the rest of the surgery is completed effortlessly. What could have been a larger zonular dialysis was prevented by the surgeon's early identification and timely management. In this last case again of a hard brown cataract, we can see that the nucleus was freely rotating in the beginning of the surgery. But as the surgeon proceeds with the surgery, the nucleus stops rotating. The surgeon gets alerted. Another golden hour. He stops and reassesses the situation. He identifies the presence of a PCR. 
he promptly converts the case to a small incision cataract surgery and completes the case successfully. Due to the surgeon's vigilance during surgery and promptness in decision making, he prevents a larger complication. Finally, the take home message of our video. When dealing with complicated cases, 1. Anticipate a hidden enemy. 2. Be vigilant during surgery. 3. Early identification of any complication. 4. Reassessment of the situation. And 5. Prompt decision making. Thank you. Concluding with the proverb, a stitch in time definitely saves nine. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Uh, the thing is, first and second case, uh, do you think just the CTR and the IUL in the bag will help on the on long run? Pseudo exfoliation, it had both cases. I, I think uh, that fixation to that is CONE or CT, uh, CTS will help. Uh, or place, placing IUL, three piece IUL in sulcus with optic capture. Uh, few cases I do in uh, gross subluxation, I used to place three piece IUL in sulcus with the optic capture. That gives a long term. Over the years, no, we have been seeing after 10, 15 years, there most of them are coming back with uh, yes, full yes. full loss of all zonules and all. Yes. So better to uh, if uh, if in pseudo exfoliation, if you feel so much of uh, you you have been part of pseudo exfoliation study which has been yes, published, no? So yes. That we took in normal cases only, sir, with no subluxation. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Next is Dr. Naveen. Dr. Navin is Dr. Nilesh. Every year, more than 2 million people worldwide, a number as big as the current population of Indore, is affected by microbial keratitis threatening their sight. Out of these, the majority occur in poor resource settings in South Asian countries with severely debilitating impact on quality of life. 2% of these infections is contributed by Pythium insidiosum. Though a small proportion, its fulminant nature and recalcitrance to therapy make it crucial to be identified at the right time. Pythium is an oomycete with morphological similarity to the microbiological appearance of filamentous fungi. It has a close biological relationship with green algae. The cell wall of oomycetes, however, is made up of beta-glucans and cellulose and lacks ergosterol. This causes antifungal agents to be ineffective against pythium, making it resistant to therapy given if not identified correctly. Unlike fungal keratitis, Majority of the patients infected with Pythium keratitis belong to a non-agricultural background. So features of fungal keratitis in an IT professional, a teacher, a student or a homemaker should prompt the suspicion of Pythium keratitis. Recognizing specific slit lamp features are pivotal for early clinical suspicion. The first sign being Tentacles. Tentacles are long linear hyphae like lesions in the corneal stroma with or without stromal reaction. But not everything that looks like tentacles is pythium. The margins of this infiltrate resemble tentacles, but this is a dermatitious fungus in hiding. For ease of differentiation, the tentacles of Pythium keratitis appear like long flagellae while the feathery margins of fungal keratitis appear like short fimbria. In radial keratoneuritis, seen in acanthamoeba keratitis, the lesion is radial and starts from the limbus going along the corneal innervation. The second classical clinical sign is the reticular margin. Fine strands of the white lesion 
seen in anterior corneal stroma resembles hyphae growth. Also, reticular margins are better appreciated in retroillumination. The third clinical sign is guttering or furrowing. The ulcer in pythium keratitis progresses circumferentially along with the limbus, mimicking a peripheral ulcerative keratitis. The fourth clinical sign is pinpoint lesions. These are pinhead like satellite lesions or intrastromal dot lesions arranged at the border of the infiltrate. Satellite lesions of pythium and fungi can be compared to granular and macular dystrophy. Fungal satellite lesions have an area with an X and Y axis, whereas the pythium lesions are pinpoint. Like any microbial keratitis, the gold standard for diagnosis is microbiology. Tissue from corneal scraping is sent for staining and culture. Gram stain. On gram staining, pythium filaments show three classic morphological features. The broad and sparsely septate or aseptate filaments, the ribbon-like folding of filaments, and vesicular extensions. Pythium filaments are broad and sparsely septate or aseptate compared to septate hyphae of fungi. They have a typical ribbon-like folding with truncation at certain points, as shown by the arrow, in contrast to linear hyphae in fungi. The intrahyphal vesicles or vesicular protrusions are depicted by the arrows which are absent in fungal hyphae. Potassium hydroxide wet mount. Similar morphological features of the filaments which are seen on gram staining are seen on 10% KOH. Culture. Flat, partially submerged, glabrous colonies are characteristic of pythium. Retrospective studies have shown that these clinical and microbial findings have high specificity but low to moderate sensitivity in diagnosing pythium keratitis. But the story has just begun. Besides being a challenge to diagnose, pythium is even trickier to manage, with patients responding poorly to conventional antifungal medication or surgical procedures such as penetrating keratoplasty. A giant leap forward in the treatment of pythium has been the use of linozolid, azithromycin, itraconazole. I'm always angry. In our current battle against the relentless forces of pythium, we wield linozolid, azithromycin, and itraconazole as our formidable weapons. Linozolid stands as our ultimate trump card, boasting an astonishing 80% resolution rate. But sometimes, even superheroes can falter against the mighty strength of Pythium. Then therapeutic keratoplasty emerges as our last, bold concentration against the unyielding enemy. However, Therapeutic keratoplasty bears a grim prognosis with an increased risk of reinfection and graft melt. Perioperative procedures have reduced complications to some extent, but with meticulous history taking, early clinical intuition, recognition of distinct microbiological features, and prolonged antibiotic therapy, we shall triumph. suggestion to you is if you uh, want to include the cinematic content like this it will give more value if it make it if you make it yourself superheroes are made by somebody else yes, with sir. a lot of uh, expense you know and uh, copyright and all those things so try some uh, yes, sir. 
Hi, this is Dr. Nilesh Kumar and today we are going to discuss the hydro procedures that go beyond hydro dissection. Often we come across situations where the BSS, whatever you use, is uh, very beneficial. So this is a case where we have mad intubation cataract and we have to perform a double rexus but we have to decompress usually what we do is we do irrigation and aspiration and snuff out all the extra cortex to decrease the pressure and then do a double rexus but what you can do is just press the lower lip and create a flow of uh, bss and uh, you can see how the cortical fibers get loose and come out and then you have a free flow free floating nucleus and then you can just snip it with a micro scissor and then using a haldi porter forcep you can do a double rexus with ease and you are very safe to perform your phaco emulsification in a beautifully 5.5 well centered rexus now this is a second situation where we often see a small piece of cortical fiber or a epinuclear plate which does not enter into the uh, suction probe so what we have to do is to express it out but it often doesn't come out very easily and for that what we can do is stop the irrigation so that it gets free free and then when we press the lower lip of the main incision it just comes and gets stuck into the uh, main incision but now as you can see that it is not coming out so what we can do is grab a macpherson forceps and try to grab the small piece and pull it out and stop the irrigation now another uh, thing is to hydro polish the posterior capsule capsule now uh, we have special sand blasted uh, irrigation cannula that can be used for hydro polishing the posterior capsule but you can see a very easy technique you can use your normal irrigation cannula and just press the lower lip and create a flow just as you created in the uh, intubation cataract and just uh, angle your uh, flow to the base of the cortical fiber attachment and you can see how uh, the posterior capsule is now clean and shiny and very beautifully and very elegantly you can place your uh, IOL in that shiny bag and give your patient the best outcome possible. The next uh, case is hydro polishing of your uh, anterior capsule. These anterior capsular fibers are quite sticky. They don't come off as easily as you saw with the posterior capsule. And the problem with the, uh, uh, the problem in polishing the anterior capsule is that the port of your suction cannula is uh, above. It directly grabs on the uh, the anterior capsule and it tries to pull it out. And you can have a zonal dialysis, so you have to be very gentle and performing this and in such cases what you can do is create an irrigation flow and then you can loosen these fibers and uh, take it out right, right now uh, what I am doing is now I stop uh, the suction the, the power and then I just irrigate with the fluid and try to loosen it up as much as possible and polish with the same irrigation cannula and you can see a lot of fiber now starts flowing out so this way it, it becomes very safe the zonal dialysis chances go down now what we usually do hydro implantation in the cases where it is uh, the iris is nicely stable and the pupil is dilated but, but, but in these cases where the iris is prolapsed from all the pores and you can see from the suction port it is coming out from the main port it is coming out and when you withdraw the irrigation it is coming out in such cases what you do just gently take your irrigation probe get the iris free from all these ports insert your irrigation cannula stop the flow start inserting your uh, IUL so the IUL uh, is uh, filling the port and no fluid is leaking out in such case the iris prolapse gets minimized but as luck had it in this case I had an IUL flip but uh, nothing to worry about 
just when you know that when you have to stop and when you have to start the flow you can easily flip it out you just stop the flow flip your eye well and then restart your flow and then just place it behind your iris into your capsular pad and nice and easy now hydro implanting uh, iul in cases of ascites is also possible what you have to do is a by manual irrigation aspiration clean out everything some hydro polishing i did and then the polishing of anterior capsule also slightly and what you have to do is just start your irrigation take your three uh, uh, piece lens and just dial it into the nucleus when you have a good valve action on your main wound you can just dial it in without much ado and you will have uh, a well centered and well placed uh, three piece iul in the back so hydro implanting in sics is not as uh, difficult or as alien as it may sound if you have a good scleral valve dial now moving on to next case you have hydro explantation of bx ring also now how to do it and when to do it and why to do it so in this case what i do is i just go and pull out entire bx and you see how it starts spinning it's not a good thing to do it might lead to endothelial loss but uh, now i am in this situation and i am in this situation because i thought that uh, in toric iul i might need, uh, need to do hydro implantation uh, and then uh, i had, i have to hydro explant the bx ring so that spinning was not good so what i did in the next case was to uh, remove disengage the bx from all the uh, sides and i never left it throughout the uh, procedure and you see how traumatic it is for the iris you can see a lot of iris pigment attached to those, that bx ring it's not a good way good sign to see it might lead to lead to inflammation later also so uh, now i improved on my technique and you can see in the third uh, part what i do in third attempt i just uh, go inside with the bx uh, or forcep uh, that comes along with the bx uh, that is supplied by bedlamine devices and no financial interest in that and i just uh, disengage one of the flanges and uh, that way you can see uh, uh, two apices are free and i uh, uh, hold the bx from one of its apex and then i disengage entirely and then try to pull it out you try to hold it from the uh, apex that is near the main wound and that's all that's how, uh, what uh, we can do all beyond the hydro processor thank you for your kind attention thank you sir points i would like to um, highlight is uh, try to reduce the background music and raise up your voice yes, so sir. that whatever is told is heard is on background music is just for uh, singing and uh, see the when you have an uh, hydro irrigating is on through a main incision and then you do it uh, for the pc polishing e even if the pupil is dilated this fluid flutter goes underneath the iris and you get iris to prolapse not just uh, mid dilated which you showed the other one also can have this one so if irrigating you can either go through a paracentesis and then let the fluid go out through the other paracentesis not use the main incision yeah. for this one so and also uh, the i uh, just uh, just to interrupt i uh, what i have recently started doing i noticed that 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 is the one fault so i now hydrate the main wound and then go through that irrigation so the that is also fine it should be not be leaking too much because otherwise it will bring in iris the second one is to the bx the b hex if you uh, do it through a main port it will have fluid going out and it will start fluttering in water uh, sometimes this upper pan will go and hit the endothelium that is very very bad for the endothelium this one eating so uh, if you release one uh, flange from the paracentesis through a 1.1 only one needs to be released and the next comes out all other others will come out easily but it has to be from the paracentesis which is next to the adjacent to the released uh, flange then it comes out through the 1.1 itself it comes out yeah. but if you want to reuse it it is better to take it out through a um, larger incision carefully but because it is a disposable thing you can take it out through the paracentesis also thank you sir thank you for thank that you. point i will keep in mind thank, thank you, you so you. much yeah so next is dr shivani and then dr nibedita
so uh, my presentation is the domino effect which is a series of cases which in which one step has led to the other to the other and then finally has led to a pc rent let us see what we've learned from these cases so in the first we have a novice surgeon who is performing the surgery uh, here we can see that it is a routine surgery the ccc is being created with a needle plexus uh, for needle uh, 26 gauge needle but the ccc is small now Learning surgery, people tend to make a small excess during the training instead, but this leads to further problems. Um, let's see the trench that is going on. The trench is not deep enough. Uh, the trench is derived from the technique that we used here. We can see that the side port is leaking because a large side port was created. That itself causes the chamber to become unstable. At this point, when we rotate, we are also breaking the walls of an already soft area. Is formed and the second surgeon takes over. In a soft cataract with a crater, it's always a challenge through a small CCC to bring the nucleus out and take over. Here we can see that multiple attempts are being made to crack the nucleus, to tear it apart, to piece by piece take it out, but because of the small excess, because of the leaking sideboard and chamber of the it's becoming more and more difficult. Multiple attempts being made are making the crater even wider, the place is being and hold with a pickle to cover. trying to get the nucleus piece by piece but the only thing that it is doing is rotating and a small piece of the nucleus is coming up every now and then. We go ahead and try to catch the dense part of the nucleus and yes we have a PC rent. There's a pupillary snap noticed. The PC is now breached. of the nuclear excess should have been increased at this point now again as we try to take the nucleus back by reaching out to the periphery wherever it is possible to hold it that may also increase the size of the rent because the fluid is constantly going down now we try now we think of multiple possibilities at this point as to what can be done the best would be to try to get the nucleus into the anterior chamber and to take over it so finally we are increasing the size of the excess so as to get the nucleus
Thank you. Uh, something happened to your voiceover in the video? Yeah. Actually, I went by the uh, guidelines. So when I read the guidelines for submission, voiceover was not mentioned, so I didn't think of. I thought it's better if I speak and tell my experience. Yeah, that's fine. This Thanks. reminded me of my third FACO case. When I was the trainee, yes. the third time I did a FACO case, the second, the second case. Yeah. Uh, first, I didn't make a rent. But then the second case was managed by my senior like this, exactly. Yes, so the chopper which was being used, I don't, I won't suggest that chopper for yeah, a youngster a for large. this kind of a soft cataract. Correct, sir. And the so decision to take uh, this kind of soft cataract to think that it is easy to do for a novice surgeon is also wrong. Absolutely, absolutely. Actually, so with uh, Ozil technology FACO, it is difficult to operate softer cataracts. Absolutely. The and tip it was is a there tip. for that. You yeah. just reduce the power. Yeah. There should not be any oscillations. Yeah. Uh, it ca you can keep it on very minimal, only 10% oscillations and vacuum, so you can just remove it by vacuum because the moment you go to position 3, you mm. start eating the lens eating and the then <laughs> it's very difficult. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Wiping out a blem. So next is Dr. Nibedita. Wiping out a blemish. Removal of a giant conjunctival nevus. Melanocytic lesions of the conjunctiva is the most common of all conjunctival tumor. They are classified into nevus, which is the most common type, then complexion associated melanosis, primary acquired melanosis, and melanoma. Among the nevi, common types are compound, followed by junctional and subepithelial. Most common location of nevus in decreasing orders are valva conjunctiva, followed by caruncle, then semilunar fold, fornix, tarsus, and lastly, cornea. A nevus is usually called giant when its basal diameter is more than equal to 10 millimeters. The usual management of conjunctival nevus is periodic observation with serial photography, as chances of malignant transformation is very less approximately less than 1%. Excision of the nevus is only required if there is sudden suspicious growth, change in appearance, and also for the cosmetic purposes. Managing such giant nevi with deep limbal involvement have several challenges. Firstly, extensive dissection by keeping a safe tissue plane may be difficult. Secondly, there may be chances of limbal stem cell deficiency after larger limbal mass removal, and lastly, closure of such large defect usually require amniotic membrane or mucous membrane graft, or use of synthetic materials. This video will demonstrate excision and outcome of one such recurrent histopathology confirmed case of giant compound nevus. 
a 30 years old Indian gentleman, presented with blackish discoloration, in white portion of his right eye. He had previous history of surgery, done elsewhere for the same condition, but had a recurrence, with more larger lesion than before, over four years. On examination, a darkly pigmented conjunctival mass, was noted, to span over, three quadrants of bulbar surface, that is inferior, nasal and temporal quadrant, along with caruncular surface. Some areas, also had, patchy distribution. The mass also involved, 3 mm inside inferior limbus, into the corneal stroma, that was extended, 2 to 11 o'clock hour margin. It did not have, any feeder vessels but had intrastromal cysts, which was clearly visible in anterior segment optical coherence tomography. These features suggest benign morphology. The patient wanted surgery for cosmetic reasons, but our concern was that, the mass was recurrent, with, deep stromal infiltration, in inferior limbal cornea. Surgery was planned for excision of the mass, along with amniotic membrane graft under local anesthesia, after taking informed consent. Under peribalba anesthesia and sterile dressing, an alcohol swab was pressed over the inferior cornea, to loosen the epithelium near the limbus. Subconjunctival saline was injected, under the nevus, to elevate it from underlying tenons, in the area to be dissected. Excision of the conjunctiva was started, from suprotemporal sector of the globe, over the tenons plane and keeping 3 mm safe margin. After excising up to inferior quadrant, dissection now shifted to supranasal area and extended in a similar fashion to complete it gradually. Dissection of the corneal part began with a lamella groove incision, made following the corneal margin of the nevus, by a splitter blade. Layer by layer. Slow dissection was carried out, from, one side, and proceeded gradually with a name to remove it, as a single mass, in the same cleavage plane. Dissection was then shifted to the other end, but, it was not coming out easily, because of very deeper involvement. A groove was made again in a separate plane, and cut it off by corneal scissors. Now, the free dissected conjunctiva, was totally removed, from its attachments at the limbus. Remaining limbal part of the nevus, was gradually pinched off, from the cornea, by scissors. In the temporal region, an area of deep episcleral invasion was noted, which was removed by superficial, lamella dissection. Rest of the nevus was cleared by multiple techniques, ranging from scraping with a blade to lamella dissection. A diamond bar polisher was used, to remove, the residuals of nevus over the cornea. Part over the caruncle was removed partially to avoid damage to it, as dense adhesion to the underlying structure, were noted. A double freestall cryotherapy, was applied in inferior limbus, because of deep invasion, and, to prevent recurrence. An amniotic membrane was laid down, with fibrin glue, to close the defect. A bandage contact lens was applied, and the surgery is completed. Histopathology of the excised mass showed, cyst, subepithelial, intraepithelial and periadnexal, sheets nest, and cords, of nevus cells, without any abnormal mitotic activity. Consistent with compound nevus. Immunohistochemistry was KI67 negative, which ruled out the melanoma. Postoperatively, 
After one month, the surface was clear, with little, patchy pigmentation. This is the eye, after one year, without any complication, and the patient was very happy, with the outcome. To conclude, every suspicious conjunctival nevus, should undergo, a histopathology examination, to exclude, melanoma, a malignant condition. The mass was a recurrent and giant one, along with a deeper limbal infiltration, usually rare in a nevus, in contrast to melanoma. Whereas, intralesional cyst and lack of feeder vessels, suggested a benign pathology. This case, despite extensive surface involvement, was managed successfully, by meticulous dissection, and following proper protocol. Thank you. So the follow-up was maintained for how many years? Follow-up now one and a half years. Okay. Thank you. The next is Dr. Hari Shankar now. And uh, after Dr. Hari Shankar is Dr. Deepali. Good afternoon, judges. Intraocular lens implantation is the standard of care for visual rehabilitation after cataract surgery. However, IL opacification may rarely occur as a late complication and can cause significant visual impairment. In such a situation, the opacified IL needs to be explanted and replaced with another IL. The present video is about one such case. I have no financial interest to disclose. My patient is a 56 years old female with no systemic illness who presented with a complaint of divinous vision in her right eye since last six months. She had a history of cataract surgery done in both her eyes about five years ago. On examination, best corrected visual acuity in the right eye was 6 by 24 and in the left eye was 6 by 9. Anterior segment examination showed both eye pseudophagia with an opacified iole in the right eye. The right eye fundus was hazy and the left eye fundus was within normal limits. The right eye ultrasonography B scan showed the retina to be attached with no vitreous echoes. So I plan to do an IOL exchange plus minus anterior vitrectomy under peribulbar block in this case. I make the temporal side port, inject viscoelastics and take a cyclodialysis spatula to swipe it underneath the anterior capsular margin so as to separate the capsular rim from the IOL optic edge. I make the nasal side port and repeat the swiping action with the spatula underneath the capsular margin. Then I take a dialer, go into the capsular bag near the optic haptic junction and gently try to pull the IOL out of the capsular bag. I repeat the same maneuver from the other side of the IOL. Yes, I am able to take the IOL out of the capsular bag. I construct the main port. and inject dispersive viscoelastic. I take a dialer and one scissors. With the dialer, I orient the IL along the main incision, introduce the one scissors and try to cut the IL into two halves, but I find that the chamber is getting cellared down, creating a threat to the posterior capsule. Then I take a three
and I dial the three piece IEL and initially place it above the iris. I inject this positive viscoelastic again above the opacified IEL. Then I take a dialer and a one hour scissors to cut this opacified IEL into two pieces. Try to support the IEL with the dialer while cutting it. I use lens holding forceps to remove the cut pieces of the opacified IEL. I try to catch the proximal half but not able to do so. So plan to catch the distal one and gently take it out. Then I realign the other piece along the main port. And gently take it out. Put viscoelastic. Then I dial the three piece IL the sulcus. The post-operative outcome was satisfactory. Patient had a best corrected visual acuity of 6.9 in the operated eye. So to conclude, IEL exchange in the case of a visually significant opacified IEL is a safe surgical procedure. If we are able to salvage the capsular bag, then we may plan to place a three-piece IEL. We can use this three-piece IEL as a scaffold to protect the posterior capsule while doing various maneuvers in the anterior chamber to deal with the opacified IEL. Thank you. Thank you. Um, did I miss miss seeing Viscobi injected into the bag after the anterior capsule was separated yeah, from the it, IOL? After the anterior capsule was separated from the IOL, yes, did you inject Visco into the capsular bag for no. further separation? No. No, sir. I didn't see that. No. Yes, sir. That's no, a good good way to open up a bag yes. much better than just touching over the uh, rhesus margin alone. This These kind of lenses are uh, uh, hydrophilic generally, hydrophilic and so they usually come out without much of addition. But there are, I have had cases which have addition in the periphery of the uh, haptic. So when we are pulling, the the pull should be controlled initially just to see whether the bag also moves sometimes the bag also will move from the periphery you won't see yes. then you'll create a dialysis thinking that the IOL alone is moving so that is one one possibility and injecting viscoelastic from outside the paracentesis is not a great idea according to me from outside the lip of a paracentesis it can cause a DM detachment easily visco going underneath and uh, uh, this viscote or high molecular weight viscoelastic could have been used before itself. Yes. 
no not after the i will when so close initially, to the end of the initially i thought sir i will not be able to say yeah i understand i yeah. understand but so these I are the possible modifications for a better outcome in this and your incision was quite big actually i like that to make it 3 mm 3.2 at yeah. least so that you don't squeeze it out through a very tight incision and uh, otherwise fine thank you sir Pavitra is there. This is a 8 year old child with post traumatic total membranous cataract with a fibrosed and calcified anterior capsule. So I plan for lens aspiration with PCI or implantation. The goals here are to aspirate the lens matter without any drop into the vitreous to remove the dense capsular plaque. and to avoid any vitreous traction or retinal complications first main port and side ports are made air and dye injected proper staining is ensured since the capsule is calcified and glow is not visible ccc was started with capsulotomy needle and micro forceps used to complete the rexus since the capsule was fibrosed so i planned the rexus circle to go beyond the fibrosed area then gentle hydro and visco dissection done to separate and lift the peripheral hard cortex now a second layer of fibrous capsule was noted and lifted with forceps and peeled then scissors was used to cut and separate the dense attachments of anterior capsule with the plug and rexus was completed Visco is used to separate the plaque from the cortex. First I tried with bimanual IA but the lens matter was very hard and fibrosed so I used forceps to separate and lift the peripheral cortex from the capsular bag. Then I used phaco probe at low settings to remove the peripheral hard cortex. Then glow was visible and dense plaque was seen attached to the PC. So first I removed the peripheral cortical fibers with IA probe. Then I injected visco alongside the plug and tried to peel it with a dialer but the PC was getting distorted and there was a risk of PC tear so I used micro scissors to cut the plug along with the PC and block as a mass all round but one part was left attached and held with forceps and first i did anterior vitrectomy below the plaque to remove any attached vitreous before pulling the plaque to avoid any vitreous traction then anterior vitrectomy was done sulcus was formed with viscoelastic A circular PC defect was seen with an irregular anterior capsular axis and a three piece IOL was placed in sulcus. With haptics rotated over the area of maximum anterior capsular rim. Pilocarpine was injected. Main port was sutured. Visco aspiration and anterior vitrectomy was completed. 
air bubble was injected to make sure there is no vitreous in AC and round pupil was achieved. So take home points include always stain the capsule in a white cataract, use micro forceps and scissors for anterior capsulorexis in case of a fibrosed capsule. If there is a thick central plaque then always remove the peripheral cortical matter first and keep the central plaque for the last. Then try to peel the plaque gently and use visco dissection. If densely attached to the PC then cut at the margins with scissors to create a circular PCC but keeping one unattached it is important to do anterior vitrectomy below the plaque before pulling the plaque to avoid any vitreous traction. Always keep a three piece IOL on standby in all these type of cases. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Pavitra, please. Untying. The suture is introduced into the anterior chamber with the blunt end mushroom tip. Difficulty faced with big mushroom tip. A bigger mushroom tip hinders its entry into the Schlem canal. Video showing the failed attempts with a bigger mushroom tip to enter the Schlem canal. Adequate sized tip is necessary for a smooth entry. Smooth entry with small mushroom tip. A smooth glide through the trabecular meshwork is evident in the small mushroom tip. With the aid of MSD forceps, the mushroom tip is inserted into the Schlem canal with a smooth movement. The smooth movement ended in a false pathway. Smooth movement is not enough to confirm that the suture is on the right track. The procedure continued unnoticed despite the resistance encountered after a few passes. It ended in false passage and the suture was visible through the pupillary area when releasing it. The 270 degree, with adequate sized mushroom tip and smooth gliding movement of the suture through 270 degree resistance is encountered. By recognizing resistance at the right time, the procedure was aborted, thus preventing a false pathway. The suture was released excising the trabecular meshwork. And a successful 270 degree GAT was performed. The 360 degree. With adequate sized mushroom tip and suture have entered the Schlem canal with smooth gliding movement. Without any resistance after 20 to 25 passes the mushroom tip appeared on the other end the cleft. By holding the mushroom tip, the proximal end of the suture is pulled gently all around 360 degrees in an anti-clockwise direction to excise the trabecular meshwork and a successful 360 degree GAT is performed. Post-operative tips. The false passage can be identified post-operatively by performing ultrasound biomicroscopy. Summary. 
GAT is a conjunctival sparing technique that increases the aqueous outflow by excising the trabecular meshwork all around 360 degrees. GAT shows results of 20 to 25% drop in IOP. Learning direct gonioscopy and visualizing angle is the first step in learning mix. Microscope tilting towards and head tilting away for 45 degrees is a paramount important step in performing mix. Patients with open angle through 360 degrees are ideal candidates for GAT. 5-0 proline suture should be handled without kinking using the appropriate instrument. Adequate sized mushroom tip is necessary for initiating GAT. Smooth gliding movement is of utmost importance for performing GAT. Resistance is the clue to abort the procedure. False pathway is confirmed postoperatively with ultrasound biomicroscopy UBM. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for nicely showing that uh, this is a little difficult procedure. Yes, sir. Rather than thinking that this is so easy to just pass it through and get away with it. Yes, sir. So many tips have been told uh, well. Thank you. So sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think we come to the end of uh, this session, the, sec the second session of the video uh, preliminary session. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, all the participants are here. We are supposed to take a photograph and send across.